flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Tell your Jesus today. Jesus, your name is power. It's breath and living water. It's such a marvelous mystery. Yes. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was in days and days to come. Well, good morning. You ready to go to work? That's what it's going to take. You know, um, prophecy in the Bible is something that you have to work at because it's interspersed all the way from the book of Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation chapter 22. And I think we're so accustomed to things being in blurbs in our day with our short attention spans that I think we're often looking for just that little one sentence explanation for things that happen in prophecy, and you just won't find that because God puts it all over the Bible, and so you do have to do some work putting it together. Now, you don't need to be the, a seminary student. Sometimes I think that works against you. I'll tell you what you do have to do. You have to be willing to work, and you have to be willing to let the Bible answer its own questions. And I get asked a lot whenever I speak for uh, groups, especially for ministers' groups, especially by young theologues. They'll always want to ask me, where did you develop your style? And they want to ask me about sermon prep. And I always say to them, sermon prep for me goes like this. I read, study the Bible over and over and over, and I ask questions. In fact, Mary Alice has said I've done that ever since I've been a teenager. I go to the Bible and ask questions. If something's happening, I want to know why it's happening, what's happening, what's the context. And so I want to do as much of that as I possibly can. Typically, I write on Wednesday mornings, and after I've done all that reading and studying, 
I'll just sit there with my computer and I always pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, where are we going today? Because I want to let the Bible take us along. And the challenge in preaching and in studying is in sequencing. You know, I want to make sure that when I stand up to talk to you, one line follows another line so I don't lose you in the process. I want you to be able to go along on the journey with me. But as I've shared with you all the way into this Revelation series, you need a Bible and you need to have a Bible. I would advocate that you don't mind marking because you want to notate things that stand out to you because six months from now, you might forget it. You know, I was talking to Stephen before the 915 service and I have a Bible on my coffee table that my parents gave me when I was 13. And when I started preaching at 16, I was preaching out of that Bible. And every once in a while, I'll thumb through that and I'll find things I marked in my Bible when I was a teenage preacher. And they still speak to me, they still minister to me. But I just want us to all be aware of the fact that in these messages from Revelation, it won't be something that we can just sort of sit and drift in and drift out of. And I can't spoon feed. I don't mean that in an, in an insulting sense. I'm just saying you're gonna have to do the work yourself. But it's like eating lobster, if you like lobster. It's work, but the meat is really, really good, okay? So today, I want to take you to the book of Revelation. We're going to look at something really exciting. You're going to need chapter 6, 7, 11, and 14, and that's just for starters. So if you have your Bible, uh, you might want to get, just get it limbered up. I want to speak today on the subject, the greatest revival of all time, and it's in the tribulation. Now, that may come as a surprise to you. I mean, it's kind of hard to believe when you think about it. If you've heard about the tribulation, and if you've been at New Spring for a while, you definitely have heard a lot about it. The tribulation seems to be Satan's last gasp field day. And in part, that's what it is. You know, we read about a one world religion that's led by Satan's evil preacher that we call the false prophet. Uh, we learn about a single global empire headed by Antichrist. And by the way, I, I get tired of using the term Antichrist, but that's because we don't know his identity yet. So we keep calling him that. Uh, I grew up in church and I've heard a lot of messages on prophecy. And back in the day, there were those who liked to tell who they believed the Antichrist was. They wanted to identify him. And I've heard, I tell you what, if I had a dollar for every stupid thing I've heard in church, I'd be a rich man. I promise you. I mean, there were, there, were, <laughs> there were people, and I guess they still do it today. They would like look at the n numeric value of the letters of somebody's name. I remember when I heard preachers preach that the Antichrist was Henry Kissinger. Now, for most of you, you have no idea who Henry Kissinger is. You're too young. He's Secretary of State under Nixon. And because he was like always brokering these, these uh, world accords, people thought, oh, maybe he's the Antichrist. And they figured it out where somehow his name added up to 666. And then it was Reagan because his name is Ronald Wilson Reagan, 666. I mean, just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Fact of the matter is, I don't know who the Antichrist is. And I won't know because the rapture happens first. And so I, frankly, I, I, that's the Lord's business. But unfortunately, I keep having to use that term antichrist because simply we just don't know who fills in that blank. But you've heard that there's a single global empire headed by the antichrist who dem demands compliance or else. And if you've read ahead in the book of Revelation, you know the time will come when all the veneer is off and Satan will demand that he is worshiped himself. And if that's what you've heard about the tribulation, you've heard right, that is true. But would it surprise you that while all this is going on, at the same time, the greatest soul-saving, heaven-filling revival is going to take place on the earth during the tribulation. There's a lot to learn. We won't begin to get it all, but we're going to get enough that we're going to want to stand up and cheer when this service is over. So buckle up. It's going to be a fast ride, and you and I are going to work together. So we're going to start right here in Revelation chapter 6. Now, if you've been with us through this series, you know that Revelation chapter six is Jesus breaking the seven seals. And each one of these seals is a subsequent judgment that's going to happen on the earth. Now, for those of you who've read ahead and you say, wait a minute, Mark, there are seven seal judgments, there's seven trumpet judgments and seven bowl judgments, you're right. But they telescope so that the seventh seal is actually the seven trumpets and the seventh trumpet is the seven bowls. So they all telescope into the seven seals. So when you read in chapter six, as Jesus begins to break the seals, what you have is Jesus opening the door to the judgments that are gonna happen on the earth. Now, the first four seals sometimes are called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
<laughs> in the early uh, 19th century, there was a sports writer who wrote about the backfield of Notre Dame, I think, and he called them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And for those of you who are sports history junkies, you may remember the photo of those four guys on horses in football helmets. But in reality, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are the first four seals. Seal number one, we talked about this already, is the Antichrist. And then there's war and some other judgments. But when we get to the fifth seal, we have something very interesting. That's what we're going to pick up today. And I want you to look at verse 9 of chapter 6. When the Lamb, that's Jesus, broke the fifth seal, I saw the souls. Now, in my Bible, I would have that souls circled. That's very important. I saw the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world, and look at this, and avenge our blood for what they have done to us. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. Okay, we're going to have to do some detective work right now because we got something right in front of us that is a big challenge. We have believers in heaven, but they're not us. I mean, we know that for a lot of reasons, but the first reason I know right out of the book is that when the rapture takes place, we get our new bodies. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says not all of us will die, we'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And then that text goes on to explain the change. In, in another scripture that talks about the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible tells us that God will bring the souls and spirits of those who have gone on to be with him, with him, and then their bodies will rise from the grave. And then those of us who are alive, if we are alive at the rapture, then we will be changed. So at the rapture, the believers who go to heaven have their new bodies. I, um, I think about the people in heaven. I don't know. I may talk about this next week. I know it's 4th of July, but hey, I just find this really interesting. And since it's a shorter sermon anyway, I'm thinking about talking about this. Um, what we learn as we look a little bit at this text, we learn the situation and the state at which believers who have died are in in heaven. Um, my dad passed away in 2013, my mom in 2020. And uh, my mom and her younger brother, they were the only two living siblings in the family, they would call each other every day. And, and I used to love to be in my mom's room and hear my Uncle Charles praying for my mother. My mother would pray for my Uncle Charles. And they might sing together. And yesterday I was conducting a funeral and I was in the procession and my cousin Ron called me. And he said, Dad just went to be with the Lord a few minutes ago. And I thought about it what it would be like for my Uncle Charles and my mom to sing together and to pray together, but this time in the actual presence of Jesus. And that did me good. Now, here's the thing. We know that when the rapture happens, we get new bodies. When, when Jesus comes back in the rapture, if I'm alive on the earth, I'll be transformed and taken to heaven right then in a new body. But my mom and dad, who are in heaven, they will also get their new bodies. And someone will say, well, how is that all, all going to take place? Well, if you read the Bible, the Bible says it will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That Greek word is atomos. Uh, tomos is the Greek word for time. With the negative prefix a, it means a time unit so small that it can't be divided. Well, we know, we know about milliseconds. So in other words, when the rapture takes place, it's going to happen in such a, forgive the term, split second. We're here, then we're there. But in the process of time, we know that believers who are taken to heaven in the rapture have their new bodies. Now, here's the thing. Now we have a situation where we have believers in heaven, but they're still in this soulish condition. Now, it isn't just that. We are told in the scripture that we just read that it is in the tribulation and others are going to be joining their company in heaven during the tribulation. So here's one of the questions that we need to do some detective work on. If these people were not saved at the beginning of the tribulation when the rapture occurred, why weren't they saved? I mean, let's just take it, take it right there. I mean, because here's the thing. We're talking about a fairly short time frame. If Jesus were to come in the rapture today, then all this would start in a matter of hours. So why were these people 
not saved at the beginning of the tribulation. We know they weren't because if they had been, they would have gone up with us. And the answer is simple. They got saved in the tribulation period. And they were martyred, you saw it, because they were faithful to the word of God in their testimony. So then, how many people are we talking about? I mean, clearly, let's just run over all that and do a subtotal. We know that people get saved in the tribulation period. They're martyred for their faith, and now we see them in the presence of God in their soulish state. How many? We're talking about 10, talking about 50, talking about 100. Go to the next chapter. Go to Revelation chapter 7 now. Look at the ninth verse. After this, after what? After what we just saw. John said, I saw a vast crowd too great to count. Well, a little later, we're going to see in this chapter that there are 144,000 people who witnessed for God. So if you can count 144,000, you know it's a bunch more than that. I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne. They're in heaven. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. Well, somebody could say, well, okay, Mark, I get it right now. There's some souls in heaven, but now we got this great number that nobody can number. Maybe that's us. We might think that if we didn't see what comes next. Look at this, verse 13. One of the 24 elders asked me, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? That's what we want to know. And I said to him, sir, you're the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are the ones who have died in the great tribulation. There you go. Now notice the language here, verse 16. They will never be hungry or thirsty. Why is that salient? Because when the Antichrist regime takes place, he'll demand that people accept the mark and they won't be able to buy or sell. But these will never be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun for the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So there you have it. From the moment the tribulation begins and all throughout, people keep accepting Jesus. And so many people accept Jesus that you can't even count how many. This is the greatest revival in history, and it happens in the tribulation right under the Antichrist's nose. I love that. And it infuriates the Antichrist, and he makes them pay. In fact, if we go to chapter 20, we will see how they die. Verse 4, and this is kind of a recap of the tribulation. And I saw the souls, there's a word again, of those who have been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. So it seems like the method du jour of execution for the Antichrist is beheading. Now, I'm sure he thought he got rid of them, but all he did was give them a one-way ticket to the throne of God. And to be honest, that's a whole lot better than staying where they were. Because, you know, and here's the thing, folks, death is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Look at, look at how the world is during the tribulation. I'm back in chapter six now. Look at verse 15. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, generals, wealthy, powerful, every slave, every free person, all hid themselves and they cried to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. That's God the Father. And from the wrath of the Lamb, that's Jesus. For the great day of their wrath has come and who's able to survive? That's fleshed out for us in chapter 9, in the 6th verse, where the Bible says, in those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. Death will flee from them. So in other words, there'll be people who want to die, but for some reason, they can't. I don't know what that means. I'm just going to take it at face value. All I want to say is, the Antichrist has not really messed these people up very much. He's just sent them straight to the presence of God, where they're told to rest and experience. And we're going to see, if I teach this next week, I just can't, I want to teach this so bad. It, it is great because all these people are singing songs that God gives them to sing, and we're going to be there. It's going to be a wonderful seven years for us in heaven during all this time. Now, here's the deal. We've got two questions about this at least, at least I do. This whole thing of all these people being saved in the tribulation, not being saved when it started, I want to know, first of all, why? Why is this happening? I mean, first question I want to know is, why didn't they accept Jesus before the tribulation? If they're so open to God that they will accept Christ in the tribulation, why didn't they accept him before? Well... The obvious answer, perhaps they never had the opportunity. Maybe they never heard. But there's something far more likely, and you're going to have to work with me for us to get this. Ultimately, in the tribulation, 
there is a line that's going to be crossed. Now, guys, I see this so clearly in the book of Revelation several times. There is a line where if people cross that line, they become at that point unsavable. They cannot be saved. They cross a line in which damnation is assured. That line, well, let's go back to the souls that are beheaded. I read to you that out of chapter 20, but let me show you what comes next, and I think you'll understand. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They, look at this, had not worshiped the beast, that's the Antichrist, or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or on their hands. What is that line that Revelation makes so clear that if a person crosses that line, their doom is settled forever? It is the acceptance of the mark of Antichrist. That's why the Bible spells it out so that anyone can know what it is with that number. And, and again, do I understand all that? No, I don't. I just know what the Bible has to say. Now, here's the thing. I've asked the question, why do they accept Christ in the tribulation and they didn't accept him before? It's so clear that they see the Antichrist regime, they hear his promises, they feel his threats, and they just say, no, not buying it, not doing it. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is a chapter about the Antichrist, it's worth reading when you get a chance. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible says this about Antichrist. This man will come to, come to do the work of Satan with, look at this phrase, counterfeit power. Counterfeit power. And signs and miracles. Now here I like the King James Version really well because it uses the phrase lying, L-Y-I-N-G, lying wonders. In other words, a whole lot of people will be deceived into believing that the Antichrist is the Messiah because he will do some kind of miracles. But scripture is very clear that these miracles are not real miracles. And so the simple reality is these people who walk right up to what the Antichrist is selling and say no, they see through. Can you see through the magic show? I mean, if you look at what's going on in our world, you see the work of Satan. Can you see through it? Now, what are these lying wonders? I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of talk today about artificial intelligence. Could it be something that has to do with AI? It's over my head. I did read this last week after I got home from church last Sunday that uh, Associated Press reported that on Friday in Germany, that would be a week ago Friday, over 300 people attended an experimental chat GPT-powered church service. The 40-minute sermon included a text generated by a chat GPT chatbot delivered by avatars on a television screen above the altar. The chatbot initially personified as a bearded man with a fixed expression and monotone voice, addressed the audience by proclaiming, Dear friends, it is an honor for me to stand here and preach to you. you know, that's creepy for real, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Technology like that? Could be. Just know what I saw. Lying wonders. But the reason why these people are saved in the tribulation is that they see through. Let me ask you a question. How many of you came to faith in Jesus Christ and you didn't necessarily plan to? You were, kind of, you were kind of buying what Satan was selling. I mean, basically, you were told that, man, fun is where the party life is, and so you're partying and doing stuff, and you just got tired of waking up on Sunday morning holding the commode. <laughs> and you woke up one day, and you know, you're like, I see through that. My friends don't see through it, but I see through it. And, and it gave you a power that you didn't know that you had to be open to a different kind of life. And that's what happens in the tribulation, except these people, these countless millions of people are going to see through what the devil is selling and they're going to say, not me. I don't know what the technology, I don't know what the lying wonders will be. I do know that the Bible says in that chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he will use every kind of evil deception to fool those who are on their way to destruction. But he won't fool these people. They walk right up, see the Antichrist agenda and say, nope, not buying. And when you read through Revelation, the Antichrist agenda looks as slick as it can be, but it's missing something. Why do they know that it's not what it appears to be? I 
Well, I can give you several thoughts on this, but to me, there's one mountain peak thought. When God calls you to worship him, he calls you to worship him so he can show you that he loves you. When Satan calls you to worship him, it's so that he can use you. He doesn't love his own. He's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said that. If you're serving Satan, you're serving a God who hates your guts. Now, he'll offer you shiny things, but all the devil's apples have worms. And so I just think that there are going to be people in tribulation. They're going to see the Antichrist agenda. And even though it promises all kind of stuff, they're going to see through it. And they're going to say, I know this guy doesn't love me. Now, this question is even more interesting to me. If the first question we have is, why is this happening? The second question that I have is, how? If, if there are countless millions of people who, who accept Christ in the tribulation, how's it happening? Somebody could say, well, Mark, you said that at the rapture, or at, I love to call it the evacuation, you said that at the evacuation, the Holy Spirit's working as he has worked in the church beginning on the day of Pentecost is taken out of the way. I didn't say it, 2 Thessalonians says it. But somebody could ask the question, if the Holy Spirit's work as he is working in the world today, drawing people to Christ is taken out of the way, how do people know how to be saved? Well, how did they know how to be saved before the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost? If you go back and look at the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, God sent prophets. In modern terms, he sent preachers. He sent people to carry the word of God. Now, I want to clarify something. The seven years that we know of as the tribulation are not exactly the old covenant, but God is working through Israel again. Now, I'm going to talk about something for a few minutes, and it may be new to you. If it is, you might want to go back to Clash of Dynasties 2, the Daniel Chronicles, and you can learn more about it. But in the book of Daniel, God gave Daniel something that he almost never gave prophets. He gave him a timetable. I mean, often God says what he's going to do. He rarely ever says, I'm going to do it at this point in time. But in the book of Daniel chapter 7, excuse me, chapter 9, God gives Daniel a timetable. And here's what God said to Daniel. He said, 490 years are determined upon your people. Daniel, what was his nationality? He's Jewish. And your city. What was his city? Jerusalem. So basically, God says, in 490 years, there's a list of things that God says he is going to do. One of the things that God says he's going to do is he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. I don't know about where you live. I live in Andover. We do not have everlasting righteousness yet in Andover. So we look at that and we're like, okay, what's God talking about here? I mean, Daniel is talking to Daniel like in the 6th century BC, and he's saying in 490 years, I'm going to do all this stuff. And we're looking at this like 2,500 years later. It hasn't been done yet. But if we read on a little further in Daniel chapter 9, we get what's going to happen. God said after the 483rd year, and that was the year Jesus died. After the 483rd year, Messiah is going to die, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Well, <laughs> a man came claiming to be the Messiah, and he wound up dying uh, on a cross, it would look like he didn't accomplish anything, but we know he did. And again, God told Daniel, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Subtract 483 from 90, what do you have? Seven. You have seven. Seven years that are determined upon God's people, Israel, and God's city, Jerusalem. So what happened in that interval between the 483rd year and those last seven years? Something called the church. God just stopped the clock. He wanted to bring in more people. You guys know I'm from Texas. I'm in Texas, where I'm from. High school football is the state religion of Texas. <laughs> if you've ever seen Friday Night Lights, it's pretty accurate. I remember many, many years ago when I was still in high school, and I don't remember the specifics, but I remember there was a playoff game in Texas high school football, and one of those Texas thunderstorms came up, and lightning was striking. And of course, in those days, they would send us all to the tunnels in the stadium. And they were, they were going to wait out that storm. But uh, it just kept storming. And finally, uh, the PA announcer said we were to all go home. And I don't remember how many minutes there were left on the clock. I think in those days, maybe it's still that way. There were like 48 minutes on a high school game. 
And I think it probably was maybe nine or 10 minutes left. And they sent everybody home. Now, the clock stopped at that point. Now, we all went home. You know, we had dinner and went to bed. Got up the next morning, had breakfast. 10 o'clock, everybody reassembled at the stadium. Players took their places on the field. Clock started back. Played out the rest of the game. Now, I know that's a football illustration, but it's very similar to what we see in the Bible. God said to Daniel, I got stuff I want to do in Israel. And at the end of that 490 years, all these things are going to happen. But the clock stops at 483. We're still waiting for that clock to start back because we are in the church age. Now, in Revelation chapter 7, 11, and 14, we're going to see that in the last seven years in this tribulation, God is going to raise up three sources And those three sources are going to proclaim salvation to people in the tribulation. Now, I look at the clock and I got about 13 minutes before 1215. I need about six hours. We're going to move as fast as we possibly can. Okay, here we go. I do want to tell you this. Before we get started, I'm going to give you my opinion on something. And I always want you to know when you're hearing my opinion versus the word of God. Because with my opinion and a dollar, you can get a cup of coffee at Quick Trip. So... And let me just say this first. I think there are parts of the book of Revelation that are not going to make sense until the people who are actually in the tribulation. I think they'll understand things that we don't understand yet today. We've already experienced that in the Bible. Because the Bible, this prophecy is in first century language, but there are things that couldn't happen until the 21st century. We we already talked about that. In Revelation chapter 1, the Bible says, every eye will see him. Well, that's first century language, but it's not really possible until the 21st century. I mean... I'm going to be facetious for a moment. By the way, what I'm about to say is not actually in the Bible. I just am making this up just to show you a model. So if you go looking for this in the Bible later, you're not going to find it. But anyway, let's say you're reading in the King James Version. You come across this. It says, and thou shalt speak unto thy chariot, and lo, it shall obey thy voice. Yea, verily, thou shalt speak to thy chariot, and music shall pour forth. And again, I say, thou shalt speak unto thy chariot, and it shall obey thy voice, and it shall show thee which way to go. Now, if I read that in the Bible 500 years ago, I'm like, what does that mean? Today, you're like, oh, you're talking about Bluetooth, Apple CarPlay, and GPS, (laughs) right? And I just think there's stuff like that. Okay, here's the opinion part. The tribulation is divided into two halves, the first 42 months and the last 42 months. And what divides those halves is that the Antichrist, after having done a peace treaty with Israel, is going to turn on Israel, and then there will be the worst part of the tribulation the Bible calls the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, here's my opinion. It looks to me like the first source of the gospel is going to come in the first half of the tribulation. I think I can make a pretty good case for that, but I don't know it for sure. What is clear is that the second source is going to be in the last half of the tribulation. So, And then there's an angel that bats clean up. So here we go. You ready? This is source number one, the 144,000 witnesses. We'll see them in chapter seven. We see them again in chapter 14. The reason why I think they're in the first part of the tribulation is we read about them on earth in chapter seven. We read about them in heaven in chapter 14, which is in the latter half of the tribulation. But now let's read. Let's get introduced to the 144,000 witnesses. This is in Revelation seven. Look at the third verse. The messenger of God says, wait, don't harm the land or sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. Now, through the years, there have been those who have tried to take this away from the Jewish people and say, oh, what the Bible is talking about here is church and Israel is kind of like a spiritualized term for the church. Look at what comes next you got a specific list of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. So clearly, we're talking about 144,000 Jewish individuals who go throughout the world sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I cannot recall the first person I heard say this. I think it may have been Hal Lindsey, but I can't remember. Someone said, what you have here is 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams. That's probably pretty, pretty accurate. So that's just great. And someone could say, well, Mark, are they the only ones who are saved in the first half of the tribulation? No, those are just the evangelists. 
because if you go back to that text I gave you at the beginning of the message, after this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation, tribe, people, language standing in front of the throne. They shout salvation to our Lord. These millions and millions of people from all over the world, they are the ones who are won to Christ by the preaching of the 144,000 witnesses. So now we're faced with another question. How do these 144,000 come to know Jesus? That's interesting to me. I remember um, back in 2019, Mary Alice and I were invited to Israel by the state of Israel. And uh, they, I think I was regarded as an influencer. I don't think that's really the case, but they wanted to show me parts of the country that tourists don't normally see. And one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was to visit a yeshiva just south of Jerusalem. A yeshiva is like a seminary. And Mary Alice and I were treated to watch so many young men studying for the rabbinic, uh, for the, for, 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 to be rabbis. I had the, an opportunity the next day to be in the boardroom of the Foreign Ministry of Israel with the Foreign Minister, and sec- what we would call the Secretary of Defense, and also the head of that yeshiva was there around the table with us and an ambassador as well. And I had an opportunity to just share our heart, what, we, what, what Bible-believing Christians believe about Israel. You know, it's one of those things where, I'll be honest with you, I did think about that. This is an opportunity to say something that could have echo effect. Maybe it won't. I know that Mary Alice and I, at that point, a little later, we went up the coastline a little north of Tel Aviv where there's a Bible college with 300 students who are training to be leaders of churches, half are Jewish, half are Palestinian, training together to build churches in Israel and share the gospel. I think, I know their ministry will have echo effect. See, I don't know exactly what happens, but I know that when the Antichrist sets himself up as Messiah, there are Jewish scholars who are going to look at the Bible and say, that is not what the Bible has to say about the Messiah. And perhaps it will be the opening to what we read in Zechariah chapter 12 in the 10th verse where the Bible says, they will look on him who is pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And hey, I don't know, maybe these messages will still be around. But then the 144,000 in the first half of the tribulation will serve their mission and it will be time for the second group. And this second group is something else. I just want you to read it with me. And this is in chapter 11. We move now from the 144,000 witnesses in chapter seven to now the two witnesses in Revelation 11. God says, I will give power to my two witnesses. They will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during these 1260 days. It's the last half of the tribulation. Now, verse five is interesting to me. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. Is that literal? Could be. Is it figurative and somehow it could be one of those things that people will understand when the tribulation happens. I just know this is the case. They're gonna preach and the Antichrist is gonna wanna shut them up and he can't. Now, who are these two witnesses? Verse six, they have power to shut the skies so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. So who in the Old Testament was given power to shut off the rain? I lied to you, you're right. And they have the power to turn rivers and oceans into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague. Who had that power in the Old Testament? Moses. Now, I'll be honest with you. I think it is Elijah and Moses, but I don't know for sure. But here's one thing I find really interesting. The last chapter of the Old Testament, which would be regarded as the Jewish Bible right now, mentions two Old Testament characters, Moses, and it also mentions Elijah. In fact, the Bible says at the end of Malachi chapter four, the end of the Old Testament, that Elijah will come first. When Jesus was on the earth, the disciples asked him about that. They said, is Elijah coming? And Jesus said, yes, he is going to come. And then he talked about John the Baptist, and he said he's already come in the spirit of Elijah. But Jesus is clear that Elijah is going to come before the end. Well, that would be really cool, wouldn't it? By the way, this is not the only time Moses and Elijah have appeared together. Because when Jesus was on the earth, he called Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. Who was up on the mountain with him? Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus about this. So that would be really cool if you think about that here, Moses and Elijah back preaching and the Antichrist wants to shut them up and he can't shut them up. And what are they preaching? They're preaching that Jesus is Lord and they're preaching that the Antichrist is a fake. 
But when they complete their testimony, and I think this is right at the end of the tribulation, um, the Bible says in Revelation 11, verse 7, Satan himself will conquer them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem. And for three and a half days, all peoples will, heads up New Spring, stare at their bodies. Would you explain to me how that would even be possible before the 21st century? It would not be. Isn't that cool? Written 2,000 years ago. They will stare at their bodies. No one will be able to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them, and look at this, and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of these two prophets. Political correctness will still be around during tribulation. In fact, that may be a precursor to it. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them, and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watch. And at this point, as I understand it, it's just about over, but God has one more appeal to make. And this is the one that just really I love. We'll call source number three, the angel. Just in case anybody hasn't heard the gospel, Revelation chapter 14 now, verse six, I saw another angel flying through the sky carrying the eternal good news. I love the translations that say it's the everlasting gospel. The gospel, folks, never changes. To proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation and tribe and language and people, fear God, give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. So just in case anybody's missed the gospel from the 144,000 witnesses and the millions who have been saved as a result of their testimony, just in case people did not catch the two, <laughs> the, the two prophets on social media. By the way, can you imagine what that's like when their bodies are lying there in the street and Fox and MSNBC and CNN are there and all the internet based? You know, we take you now to Jerusalem where we're the two bodies of the... And then phew, that's going to be something to see. <laughs> But just in case anybody missed it, there's an angel that's going to back clean up and one more time just give the gospel to the whole world. It's interesting because when Jesus was on the earth, disciples asked him about the end time and he said this. He said this good news will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. Like we just read about that angel and Jesus said, and then the end will come. Well, thank you for being with me in this journey. I know it had to be like drinking out of a fire hose, but I wanted to put these things together so that you could see the greatest revival of all time is going to happen right under the Antichrist's nose, and he can't do a thing about it. What do we learn? Real quickly, number one, Satan can never stop God from building his family. Number two, God will do whatever it takes to reach you. Whether it's, <laughs> whether it's sending 144,000 or if it's one of those millions who talk to you or if it's an angel flying in the sky or two prophets from the Old Testament, God will do whatever it takes to reach you. All you old new springers, you know that I love 2 Samuel 14, 14. The Bible says God does not sweep life away. Instead, he dreams up schemes to bring the rebel home. I love that. How many of you here were rebels and God dreamed up a scheme to bring you home? <laughs> And if somebody said, how did you change from being an atheist to being a follower of Jesus? You just say, it's a God thing. Well, you know, you used to party with me, and you know, you, how did you change from that to a ra radical new springer? And you're like, well, just stuff happened, you know, and it's just a God thing. Oh my goodness, God is into that. He dreams up schemes. I mean, I don't know how many people be here this weekend, six, 7,000. I don't know how many more watch us on television. Wouldn't it be something to just go around and us all talk to each other and tell about what God did to bring us to Jesus? <laughs> Number three, third thing I learned from this, Satan's kingdom will start out with the promise of shiny things, but when you see through it, all he has left is force. God's offers are love, adoption, blessing, and everlasting life. 
Well, I should end the sermon right now, but I know there's somebody sitting out there on a question that you are dying to ask. It's probably a guy. <laughs> Might not be. Yeah, but here's a question you want to ask, so I'll just ask it. What if I miss the rapture? Can't I be saved in the tribulation? I'm going to tell you, I honestly do not know the answer to that question. Now, there's a back when I was talking about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there's an interesting statement there that right after it talks about the Antichrist and his lying wonders, it says they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them, so God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they'll believe the lies, and then they'll be condemned for enjoying the evil rather than believing the truth. Does that mean that people who have had an opportunity to hear and turn away, they won't? I don't know. I really honestly do not know. I will say this. If you don't go up in the evacuation, I sure wouldn't take the mark. I would not. But why wait? Why wait? Somebody can say, Mark, I just got some partying I want to do. That stuff, that stuff will mess you up. I mean, you already probably are messed up. Your, your friends want to tell you that. You're like, well, you know, I got, I got some deals that are not strictly honest. I need to get them done before I accept Jesus. You, you don't want dirty money. The Lord, I love the verse in the Old Testament where the Bible, one guy, he, he, he tried to make a deal and it didn't work. And God told him he needed to straighten up. And he said, well, God, what about all that money I've lost? And I love this line in the scripture. The Bible says this, the Lord can give you so much more. Why wait? Why wait? I don't know when Jesus is coming back in the evacuation. I don't see anything else that has to happen prophetically. It could happen today. It could happen 10 years from now. I don't know. I don't know, but why wait? Don't you want to be ready to go up with that first group? I do. You say, Mark, are you asking me to join New Spring Church? Well, we'd love to have you here. No doubt about that. But that won't get you into heaven. You say, Mark, I see people be baptized. That is the first thing you should do after you've accepted Christ. No matter how hard you hit the ball, you can't go to second base first. That's first base. And if you're saved and you haven't been baptized yet, I'd sure get that done. But baptism will not save you. It is for people who are saved. It's a tangible expression of an internal change. You know, trying to be baptized without accepting Christ would be like wearing a wedding ring without being married would be kind of cheesy. Somebody could say, Mark, are you asking me to start doing better? Well, we should all be doing better. But you know what? You can't save yourself. The only way you can go to heaven is to file spiritual bankruptcy and say, God, I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. I can't I can't be perfect. And what am I going to do to pay, pay you back for all those things I've done wrong? God had a way. Remember I said God will dream up schemes to bring rebels home. His first and greatest of all was to send his son into the world to live the life that we can't live. And then to turn around with that perfect life and die on a cross and pay for everything we've ever done wrong. So that anyone all of us, no matter what we've done, can come just like the old hymn says, just as I am, just like I am right now. Faults, warts, trouble, bad habits, crazy stuff that we do. Come like we are and receive Jesus, accept his salvation. Let him change us from the inside out. And the Bible says it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Why would anybody turn this down? That's why I hate religion. Religion says jump through these hoops and you might be accepted. The Bible says accept Jesus and you get adopted into God's family. You may be watching on television. You may be watching online. You could be watching over in North Auditorium or you could be here in South Auditorium. But if you want to settle that, you don't even have to get out of your seat because the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can't change, you can't undo, but you can call. You don't even have to pray out loud. You can just pray in your heart right now. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You don't have to use these words. I just want to give you something as kind of a template. 
But if you mean these things in your heart, there is a God in heaven who will hear your prayer and he will change you and adopt you in this family. Write your name in the book of life and you're God's child before you get out of your seat today. Here we go. You don't have to pray out loud. You can if you want to. Dear God, I am a sinner. I can't save myself. But I believe you love me. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and he paid for all of them. And I believe he arose from the grave. And because Jesus is alive, I want Jesus to be my savior. I bow before him as my king. Give me the power to live a new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay where you are, please, just for a second. If you just pray with me, I have a gift I want to give you. Now, in this box, there is a New Spring Bible. There's a book I wrote called My New Walk with God that will answer a lot of questions. Some other cool stuff. It is free, F-R-E-E, -E, no strings attached. If you're watching us online or on television, just text PRAYED to 97000, P-R-A-Y-E-D, Follow the steps. We will mail this stuff to you this week. But if you're on campus on any of our venues, you don't have to wait. Just text PRAY to 97000. Go to any info center. You'll see them by the blue and white colors and say, I pray with Mark. They will not hassle you or stalk you. They just want to give you this box so you can, they, you can take it with you today. Guys, next week we have a huge service, 4th of July service, and I think I'm just going to have to preach what I'm feeling like God is leading me to preach. So we'll see you next weekend.